Well, we're sort of recovering from last night's uh, tent meeting and outdoor worship service, and uh, what a beautiful thing that is. You know, these uh, tent revivals, right, that have happened, and if you read the history of, of this nation, there's, there's been revivals. And, and some of them, though, they uh, emphasize what people are doing. That they're getting right with the Lord. They're recommitting themselves to Christ. We know some of the churches are rebaptizing people, which is not scripturally uh, encouraged or mandated, by the way. But on the one hand, you get it, right? Revival. We need a revival in this nation of not just having our stomachs filled by the Creator God and, and having all these material possessions and and blessing, but we need a revival of our spirit and our soul, and how we treat one another and love our neighbor. And that's something we can't do. So any revival that starts with you or, or starts with me, we're in big trouble. <laughs> Revivals start with the commitment of God, because our commitments fall short. And so we're starting a little uh, sermon series here. It's just three weeks before we dive back into the gospel of Mark later this year. But the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about God's revival in us, God's work in us. And today we talk about commitment. That's God's commitment to us. Next week, we'll talk about communion, His communion, uh, His work in us, in that relationship and His presence in us through the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's in John chapter 6, both weeks. And then the third week is from uh, Joshua, the 24th chapter. And if you're familiar with that Old Testament, beautiful picture uh, where the people of God are in a covenant renewal ceremony and event. And of course, that covenant renewal prepared us for the new covenant. And so in, in the third week here, we will talk about the covenant renewal. And those are the texts that we'll be using from John 6 and Joshua 24. So what does this look like, Pastor? God's revival in us. Well, it starts with His work. And yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about our response because when God revives you, when God touches you, when He makes you alive, He causes you to be born again, it produces new life inside of you that wasn't there before, and there's going to be a response, a, a new commitment, a new purpose for your life. But first, let's talk about God's work in us. You know, God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, Jesus. That's how committed He is to your salvation, so that the, we respond in faith and belief in the bread of life and are committed to His mission. God shows His commitment when He first acts. He sends His Son into the world. And He knew what that meant. Because crowds, well, crowds can be very fickle, can't they? And it's quite interesting the way this text that we're looking at today begins verse 22, there on page 1059. On the next day, the, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea, that's the Sea of Galilee, saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples. So, jump to verse 24. So, when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples they themselves got into the boat and went to Capernaum, and they were doing what? They were seeking Jesus. Wow. Well, this sounds like a pretty good community. Uh, that sounds like a, a pretty awesome crowd. Why were they seeking Jesus? Because Jesus first sought them. Jesus first comes into this world, and, and he follows in the line of John the Baptist, who's preaching repentance from all the chaos, from all the commitment to sin and death and idolatry and immorality and our, our commitment to live uh, with the world and be of the world. And, and John comes preaching a, a very different message. He says, repent. 
and turn back to Almighty God. So what I love about God's commitment to you is that we can be kind of a fickle sometimes. We can kind of be a little bit uh, difficult, but the Lord keeps pursuing us. We try to destroy ourselves with our sin and addiction, and God keeps pursuing us. He is totally committed to your salvation. He is totally committed to each and every one of you. From the moment that God took, made something out of nothing, He used your mom and dad and conceived your life in your mother's womb. And you hear me refer to this quite often, right? Because think about that. That's powerful. A life inside a mother's womb. It should be protected, should be valued equally to the mother. You know our stances on, on all of that and protecting the mom and protecting the child. Clear up till God can knit that child and bring a, a healthy birth. But do you realize, sisters and brothers, when God allowed that life to happen, his commitment to you was for eternity because that human being in a mother's womb, now with a body being knit together, has a spirit and a soul that will exist forever. And that's why God intended it to be. And that's why he's so committed to you. He wants that eternal life to be one not of damnation, not of suffering and torment and, and, and after the last day and where there's judgment. He wants that life to be eternally with him to be brought back out of the kingdom of Satan and darkness into the kingdom of our Lord, where there's living bread. He uses food as a metaphor here in our text this morning. Isn't it fascinating? And God's radical. This this is radical commitment. So radical, He sends His Son into this world. That's radical, to allow your Son to be in this sinful world, to be mistreated and abused and mocked and, and misrepresented, that's his commitment to you. That's awesome. That's amazing. And our staff and our leadership teams and among our groups here, we're starting to talk about three boxes. And I know those Old Testament passages. You don't have to, to remind me, but we should be reminded, right? Remember when... Uh, they were like, hey, we need to get a temple for the Lord. We're going to build him, right, a big box, right, a big temple. And the Lord reminded David and then reminded Solomon, his son, who was going to move them out of this, this makeshift tent of meeting and, and out of the tabernacle into a beautiful temple. And yet God reminds us that he cannot be contained behind the temple walls. He is the God of the universe. He is the God of all creation. And that power is the God who is committed to your salvation. And he's just given us a little reminder that he's way beyond uh, the church walls and his love and action. And so we're not trying to put God in a box here. But God has worked in kind of three distinct ways over the, the centuries with his people. He empowered, he established traditions, he has tra- established customs. If you've ever read the book of Leviticus... And went through that, you see a lot of ceremonies and a lot of things that were to prepare God's people for the coming Messiah. God continues to do that for us today, to empower current ministries. We'll look at one of those boxes here in just a minute. And those are good, those are God-pleasing, but there's moments in history where God actually shifts and He stops something from happening so that he can enable box three, which is creating a vision and a mission for the future. So he stopped the old covenant, and he brings the new covenant, and he sent prophets uh, to preach about that and to speak about that. That old uh, covenant, in a couple weeks we'll talk more about it, but uh, it's it's conditional. That old covenant with the ceremonial laws, you remember those laws? lists and lists of laws in Leviticus. And he stops all of those with the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ fulfills the law totally, and he gives visions to enact his new uh, mission. He uh, gives uh, revelation into the New Testament so that the church stops certain things and starts new ones under the discipleship of Jesus Christ. 
Well, let's look at one of the things God continues to bless us here in uh, that first uh, empowering and sustaining current ministries. We are about halfway through the year, a little over. We're now into August, July. God continues to bless what's going on here. And I wanted to just give you this little update. This is the giving groups here at Divine Shepherd. And we can't get a lot into detail. We'll probably have a town hall meeting to, to celebrate this. But you see what's happening in our midst? When you think about time and treasure and talent and how God took those two loaves, and, excuse me, those, wait a second, uh, those five loaves, one, two, three, four, five, and two fish. <laughs> See, that's why we have some of this here, right? To remember so we don't get it mixed up. Remember these Bible verses, right? Remember who died on the cross to pay for our sins, I remember the waters of baptism. Five loaves and two fish. Jesus took those five loaves and those two fish, and he multiplied them to provide for thousands and thousands of people beyond what they could imagine, and they had left over afterwards. Right? We think we're committed to the Lord, but oh, he's more committed to you and me. And this is pretty cool, right? You think about this. In 2022, 69 households had given over the course of the year somewhere between a few bucks and $100 in their annual giving. And since then, 110, that means 41 more households have started saying, thank you, Lord, for my daily bread. And I have so much daily bread. Thank you, Lord, that I'm going to steward that and invest that here at Divine Shepherd so that more people can have their daily bread. The more people can have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you see those giving groups that get larger and larger and larger. And we know some folks are not blessed in a way right now. Maybe it's previous debt or previous decisions that they're able to give anything financially. And that is just fine. That is why the church and the scripture teaches that, that this type of generosity should not be done under any type of compulsion, but out of the generosity of your heart, of loving the Lord. And so as those groups get bigger, you see that, that uh, a number of them have grown and some of them got a little bit smaller, and that's because it often is the case that people jumped up a group or two but when you do the grand total of just this one element of generosity, you see 61 additional households. That includes multiple people. If you're single and giving here, you're one household. If you're married and giving here, uh, and there's two of you because marriage is between one man and one woman, uh, that, then you're one household, even though there's two of you. And if you have lots of kiddos, you see what I'm saying, but 61 households over the course of a year, that's God multiplying and sustaining current ministry. And for that, we are incredibly thankful and appreciative. Just like the people in the crowd, they're going from one side of the sea to the other side because they know who's really doing that. It's not man, but it's Jesus. He's multiplying the blessings among them. And that's what Jesus does. And Jesus stretches us. Last December, you voted to incorporate into the annual giving uh, some stretch goals. I mean, to really stretch. Because you knew we needed to, to fix some stuff in the gym and replace some lights. And, and you're not wanting to use all of the... the uh, reserve funds uh, to do that. And so you, you voted for a budget to stretch. And we're seeing that we're being stretched a little bit because here through July, we're, we're just a little bit behind. And on the one hand, if it just depended on one person, wow, that would feel like a lot behind. Kind of like those disciples. We're like, what kind of strategic planning did you do here, Jesus? There's thousands of people out here, and we only have a few loaves and a couple fish. What were you thinking? We could do that, looking back at December. What were we thinking? But I, I don't think that's what the text this morning or what this is showing us. What it's showing us is God stretching our faith and calling us to think about. You know, if you took that little bit that we're behind and you split that out by the, the, the households, it's, it's just a few hundred bucks per household to, to catch up. 
And the electricians, by the way, are coming on Monday <laughs> to help fix some of those things uh, that need fixing in the gym and sanctuary. When you look at the average attendance, which also continues to go up and sustain previous uh, averages, and what a blessing that is, it, it, it adds up to that. I'm sharing this because, you know, on the one hand, you've heard me earlier this year uh, do things in box two. We stopped a few positions. We reduced a few hours. We're changing some other things, uh, like, for example, some, some smaller things like uh, the heartbeat. Rather than all that staff time and hours and printing every single week or printing a couple times, we, we saw that most of that content really covers a whole month. So I'm going to be asking the staff only to print the printed newsletter, which we read and then recycle and read and recycle, just printing it once a month. And that's going to free up staff time to work on some other things like creating a vision together. And if something pops up in the middle of the month, we'll email you, which is still free, thanks be to God, we'll email you what's going on. We have so much to celebrate. And so many uh, blessings to count. Some things and other things we might need to scale back a little bit. But what is God doing in your midst as you recognize His commitment to your life through Jesus Christ to cre create vision and purpose for your future? God is utterly committed to you. You notice in John chapter 6, the gospel for uh, the message today, Jesus is not inside the church building. He's not inside the temple. Oh, he was there a lot. It was his custom to go to the synagogue. It was his custom to go into the temple. And he was preaching, and he was teaching, he was fulfilling prophecy, and he was showing God's love to both the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those who missed all of those prophecies, he still showed them God's love. And yet, in John 6, he's outside, isn't he? Some people might have thought, boy, the leaders are really crazy. Don't they know that it is hot outside, 90 plus degrees, almost 100 degrees yesterday? Uh, the summer fest went off in a wonderful way. Are we committed to the community like God is committed to us through His Son? I love to see that we are. So many Divine Shepherd volunteers and members. Car shows. Did anybody see that Tesla? What is that thing called? The Tesla truck out there? That was incredible. And those Corvettes and those classic cars. People out showing, right, their commitment to enjoying community together. We're pretty excited. You notice we had over a thousand people registered. Um, we had plenty of food, plenty of beverages. Little Lamb, they did their singing. The worship service went off wonderfully. Thank you, ministry and praise band, uh, for all that you did. Uh, the Swing Tones brought a festival fair to it after the worship so service, and, and they, they played. And then we had a, a quartet of, of gospel singers from the Omaha area, and inside was air-conditioned, so if you needed to cool off, you get plenty of free water. And outside was a lot of fun, and, and there was plenty of shade and plenty of uh, breeze to be found. You probably don't recognize this guy from the back. That's a U.S. congressman who lives in the Bellevue area. That's a U.S. congressman, Don Bacon. We're not endorsing any political figure here at Divine Shepherd. We know you can listen to what they stand for and their conscience and their morality and their character and their values and how they're going to use their authority. You want why he came? He came, he wanted to share the most important five Bible verses that when he was deployed into Afghanistan, when he was in the active military, and now when he is active as a U.S. congressman, the, the most important five Bible verses that God has used in his life to change his heart, to change his eternity, and to change how he governs together with the Congress. Boy, you want to talk about a revival of God in this nation. When we're electing leaders 
that are willing to stand up in public and reference the Scripture and the power of God and the Word of God about the bread of life, Jesus, His Son of God, that's going to revive this nation. That changes worldviews. That changes heart. That changes because it calls for us to love God, to love our neighbor, and even to love our enemy. So we're really happy that he chose in his short time to leave his, his family and to, and to come spend a couple hours with the outdoor tent meeting of Divine Shepherd Summerfest. Kind of a new thing. Will we do it again next year? I don't know. I didn't say it was going to be an annual thing. Do we have some things to tweak? Probably. Love your feedback. What other creative things can we do together under God's leadership, compelled by His Word, to reflect the love of God into our community? Each and every one of you have an answer to that question. And it starts with God's commitment to you in His revival, in your daily life, in your spiritual life. You notice that in the midst of all of the commitments, and a lot of those are good and God-pleasing, you're committed to be a wonderful husband, you're committed to be an amazing wife, committed to your children, committed to honoring your father and mother, you're committed to vote this year, which you should as a citizen of the United States of America, and, and vote your conscience. And all these commitments, we got commitments to work, we got commitments to development and getting new skills. Commitments, 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 commitments. Your God wants to support you in all those God-pleasing commitments and to be the greatest that you can be at each and every one of those. But God is not just there for us to have the greatest job and the greatest business to fill our bellies just for ourselves. He's much more than that. And that's why Jesus, I think, in this text today, said to the crowd, don't work for food that perishes. You know, like... uh, fences that you see this last week after the storm are strung all over. As good as fences are, we can have a fence. I saw a trampoline that had gone out of the backyard and into the street. Over there in 168th and Giles, the roof off of a house right into the road. In this storm last week, have a working roof, have a great fence, have a great job have a great family. God wants all of that for you, and He continues to multiply those loaves and fishes so that you have that. But listen to Jesus. Work for the food that endures to eternal life, your spiritual life and relationship to Him, which the Son of Man will give to you. May God's revival in us through Jesus Christ, His only Son, continue to work miracles among us continue to revive us as we then are sent into the community to communicate God's love to others. And He is faithful. He will give life to the nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may this peace of God, which comes through this amazing Word of God, keep your hearts and minds connected to the bread of life, Jesus' His Son. Amen.